Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Greater Columbus Sports Commission's Virtual Sports Report presented by Marathon. I'm Linda Logan, Executive Director of the Sports Commission and your host today, and so happy to have the Commissioner of the Ohio High School Athletic Association, Jerry Snodgrass, joining us today. And just some quick housekeeping notes. Um, we will have some time for questions. So throughout the program, please um, put those questions in the chat section of Zoom and we will try to get to them as many as possible at the end of the interview. So welcome, Jerry. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you through all of this. And I have to give a shout out to your sponsor, Marathon Oil, that's headquarters, headquarters sit about six blocks from my home in Finley. So uh, thank you for having me on and certainly thank you to your sponsor for doing this. Well, I see that you're in your office today and I know um, our guests are probably most of them sitting at home. So um, it's great to see you. And I guess we can jump right in and just talk a little bit about, you know, how you're doing with your team, your staff, and, and just uh, really as the high school association was ready to gear up for this, all the many state tournaments in March, really you were one of the first uh, to have to make some really big decisions. I, I think all of us now know what we know, but we certainly did not know that 10 weeks ago. Maybe you could talk a little bit about all the decisions that had to be made really uh, to be nimble and pivot. Yeah, you know, you highlight a lot of that from the simple standpoint that there was a lot that we know today that we didn't know then. And, and that really highlights, I think, for so many of us, whether it's me, uh, whether it's the NCAA, whether it's the respective conferences in the NCAA that had to make decisions at the time that we knew, I think collectively, we knew they were not popular. We knew the effect they were going to have on people. Sometimes I think they had more of an effect in high school sports because it's so community oriented and the impressions, the emotions that younger kids have versus, you know, young adults that are playing at the collegiate or adults that are playing at the professional level, but um, forced to make some very tough decisions based upon the medical evidence, based upon our superiors. When I say our superiors, I'm talking about the governor, I'm talking about uh, our schools, I'm talking about the Department of Education. And those decisions have been tough along the way, but you still go back to March and it's absolutely amazing when we go from March 10th to May 21st, what has transpired in that period of time. It is just unbelievable what's transpired and relative to our staff, um, we fortunately, I felt were prepared. We developed a remote working plan uh, so we kept everybody engaged and everybody agreed to be, and it actually was a format, formality that we did, made certain that everybody had materials, they had computers, um, and we were prepared. And I would almost tell you that our communication, because of the different platforms from Zoom to one of the platforms we use internally, we've been more engaged than we've ever been, and probably with the every every day changing events, have probably worked harder during this time than we've ever worked. I think a lot of people think that in the sports world with no sports, nothing's going on. It's almost been the opposite for us. And a lot of it on the fly. So it's been challenging, but at the same time, it's what we signed up to do. We just never thought we would sign up for this kind of a crisis. We may have lost Linda, Jerry, so I'm going to go ahead and step in, and we've actually got a ton of questions already, so why don't we just dive into those questions? I know you're That's a pro great. this by now, so um, the first question is, how confident and comfortable are you that high school football will happen in the fall? You know, that is a, that is a question that is just burning for everyone, uh, so I want to preface it by saying, no one wants it back more than we do. High school football on Friday nights, and it's not just football. Soccer has grown in popular. It's one of the few sports that continues to grow uh, in attendance and, and participation. But um, nobody wants it back more than we do. Friday night football for communities brings people together. The people want it back. So how confident are we, or am I? I would tell you the next couple of weeks are really going to answer that for me. Because I think, for, personally, and it's an opinion, but what happens in the next couple of weeks as we reopen Ohio responsibly, 
and I stress that responsibly, is really going to determine what happens in the fall. And while people say that we are at a lower risk with our students, you know, the age group, well, our officials, everybody else, the fans, the uh, auxiliary people, they're part of this too. So it's not just the age group, but, but again, I just stress the, it's going to depend on the next couple of weeks. And I'm an eternal optimist. And I do believe, if you were to ask me right now, I do believe that we will go forward in a normal routine with football, with some safeguards, but with attendance and so on and so forth. That's the eternal optimist in me. But I have to stress that we're prepared if we can't. Well, we love that internal optimist in you, Jerry. So next question from the audience. We've seen the May 26th date for some of the high school sports to start back up with the non-contact for coaches being lifted. Is that date still valid? It is valid. And I think one of the biggest challenges that it's been difficult for us to communicate. And I say difficult for us to communicate because in, within the boundaries of the state of Ohio, we have roughly 350,000 student athletes that we serve. We have roughly 65,000 board approved coaches that we serve. And then you throw in the fans, the parents. Getting that out, it's tough for me to email every one of them. It's tough for Tim Street to, to communicate. You know, we rely on all these different methods to communicate. So communicating has been extremely challenging. I will say from that that the orders that we have had to follow are based upon the governor and the state director of health, Ohio, the Ohio Department of Health. We have no authority at all to overrule them. And for every parent that wanted us to have softball prior to now, or foot, or excuse me, or baseball, the MLB didn't have baseball. You know, all these things. The practicality of us having it was slim and none. But given the governor's orders for the 26th to reopen, and reopen again safely, at this point, our school sports are over. That's what a lot of people maybe are misunderstanding. We're done with our spring sports. We're done with school sports for the 1920 calendar year. Everything that goes on from this point is a non-school function. Even though somebody might say Pickerington is playing Reynoldsburg, they're not. It's the name they nobody's trademarked that name. So given the governor's orders of the 26th, our job has been to provide guidance to those sports that have been permitted and now move on from there and give that guidance and do it safely. So I'm very confident that we will stick to that. I again think that we have to be very cautious and that's what our guidance to our schools is providing. Great. And you touched on this a little bit, but I want to make sure we address the question. Uh, since local school districts decide whether they can open their facilities, does OSHA provide guidance on that? Or does it fall on the schools when they can open their fields, weight rooms, et cetera? That has been one of the more confusing things because the um, School Closure Act required buildings to be closed. I didn't issue that, you know, obviously. Um, I don't have that power to do that. I believe that was signed by Dr. Acton. I think she has the authority to do that. I can't remember the date at which that was signed, but the School Closure Act did just that. It closed schools. So for us to say that, okay, coach, you can go into the gym and start doing things, we have zero authority to do that until that act, School Closure Act, would be amended. And I think, again, a lot of people... Again, I can go with the volume of people that we deal with. Didn't quite understand that. You know, I can step in and say, okay, uh, you know, uh, Gehanna Lincoln, your school is now open. Uh, at least your gym is. I have no authority to do that. Do I see that being amended? I'm hopeful we do. And that could happen any day. That could happen any hour. But that's in our communication with them. So where the confusion became, was in outdoor facilities. And that, that is under the direction of the Department of Health. And the Department of Health has actually turned that over onto the local departments of health. I think, forget how many there are in the state of Ohio, local departments of health. But so in any community, the local Department of Health will determine whether that baseball field or softball field can be opened. Where that becomes very confusing, so confusing, is so many of those facilities are school owned 
obviously school facilities, but youth, travel, club, all these things in the summer, use them. So that's a conversation that we have had with the governor's office literally in the last 48 hours about how confusing that is and how that could be helped if schools had their local authority instead of the Department of Health. And I know that sounds confusing, but you're talking about me trying to convince the governor and the lieutenant governor on that. And I will tell you, they're listening. They've listened very well. We've had some very good dialogue on that. Well, we appreciate hearing that, Jerry, and your transparency during this. So the questions keep coming in, so we're gonna keep going, okay? I'm what good. is your <laughs> what is your reaction to the NFHS guidance for state associations to consider for reopening high school athletics? Will Ohio follow these or modify to meet our situation? Great question. I'm glad whoever asked that because uh, we had a lengthy meeting to review that document. Many have seen those guidances, that the guidance that has been put out by the NFHS. I actually, I did not know it was going to be released to the public um, yet because the meeting that we had to review every single line of that with all of the state association executive directors and slash commissioners as we walked through that that was to serve as a framework for each state so in other words if our governor or department of health put something more strict obviously we'd have to follow it so this was to serve as a framework and prior to this coming out uh, i have two staff members uh, that headed up a group internally to work on that same guidance and they were using they were going to use that as soon as it came out but other organizations too u.s olympic committee the ncaa i even believe some youth organizations might be literally i'm not certain on that but others have put out similar guidance the idea from the nfhs was that this serves a framework for all 50 states that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we will have to tweak it we probably will be distributing that either tomorrow or Monday. And again, a little bit depends upon what goes on in governor's uh, news conferences uh, that could be announced in that meantime. So we will be using that as a framework, yes. And that's all we can do, by the way, is we can't provide it as requirements or mandates. We can only provide it as guidance because, again, our school sports are over for the year. Hard to believe, right, that we are already done with the, the year. So um, our next question is from a friend at the dispatch. He's wondering, the NFL and college football have more resources than OSHA to ensure safety, testing, um, food control, things like that. How will high school sports handle that? That's a great question because a lot of people are not aware that the National Federation of High Schools, the NFHS, who we and all states are members of, actually is housed in the same building in Indianapolis with the NCAA. So there's a lot of collaboration between the two there. There are many things, and I'll, I'm straying a little bit when I say this, but the certification of baseball bats, for example, a safety issue, um, is the testing for those. And now, by the way, baseballs themselves are tested for um, the rebound, I forget the name of it, but uh, uh, resistance and all that. Those are tested by an organization called uh, NOCSE, N-O-C-S-A-E, I forget the letters for it. It's very expensive. And hey, the NFHS is great. They steal the research from the NCAA that's next door. So even though the NFHS maybe doesn't have its own for that, for the equipment testing, and I'm talking equipment testing there, they partner because they're in the same building with the NCAA and we utilize that same testing. Medically speaking, and the um, NFHS has one of the strongest sport medicine advisory groups, they call them SMACs, uh, Sport Medicine Advisory Committee, uh, in the nation of any organization. It's very, very strong. Um, there was a um, Dawn, I can't remember her name, actually from uh, Children's Hospital in Columbus, she's no longer there, but uh, was a very big figure in that through the years. So Ohio had some very good representation on that SMAT. And each state has its own. So Ohio has its own Sport Medicine Advisory Committee. So always hand in hand. And I think many people forget that everything we do is rooted in the safety. 
And I'll give you an example, if you don't mind. There was a lot of talk because the NFHS guidance that came out talks about respiratory dro droplets. The number one thing that has to be controlled are respiratory droplets. So in no shortage of suggestions to me on a daily basis, many people have reached out and said, they've got a great idea. Everybody in football, everybody in this sport wear a plastic shield. Sounds good. But unless that plastic shield is tested rigorously, and I'll use the Noxie as an example, then it could provide more risk than it does safety. And so I can't communicate that, that to the 350,000 student athlete parents. I'd like to, and we do in some way, shape or form. But again, going back to the original question here, all of this is rooted in safety. And we utilize, even though they do have better resources, we share them. Thank you for that thorough response there, Jerry. We're Too learning a lot, right? I know that. Yeah. <laughs> we're certainly learning a lot. I think safety is such that key word we're, we're continuing to hear. Um, our next question is, will cross country be added to the list of sports that the non-contact period uh, being lifted uh, next week? Most likely. Um, Again, keeping in mind that our no contact periods were put in place for one reason and one reason only. It was the only regulation that we really had to support the governor and the State Department of Health's um, restrictions for social distancing, all the safety restrictions. And by eliminating, I mentioned 65,000 coaches, 64,999 of them are great but we have one out there somewhere that probably would go out on his or her own and try to do things. By enforcing a no contact period, if we can just prevent one, I'll call it accident, you know, we're going to do that. And that's what we did with that. The reason that the uh, cross country, and I wasn't totally um, vetted in that, but there was some concern about how group training in cross country would exceed the limitations on mass gatherings and all that. But I see as things develop over the next week or so, I anticipate several things maybe being lifted and that will probably be one of them. Great, great. Can you talk a little bit about um, OSHA's decision regarding um, expanding the football playoffs with that news that came out? Yes, you know, it's an interesting concept because again, with all the people that we serve, and our fans, which by the way are our customers. They buy the tickets, 82% of our revenue coming from ticket sales. So um, many people, I, I really do believe, um, have this feeling that I or our staff members, even our football administrator, sits behind a desk and says, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna propose this, uh, so on and so forth. It does not work that way. Um, our, we are governed by our schools. Our member schools are who I and our staff work for. We also, although we have very, very intelligent staff members that think ahead and propose things, we also provide organized 503C uh, nonprofit coaches associations to present recommendations to our board of directors. And I have instituted that just in the last two years. I think that's only fair. We used to do it years ago. And because I just think they should have a say. The tough challenge for a board of director who's elected from our member schools is to take that information or that recommendation, determine whether it's good or bad using staff input, and move on and approve or say no. Our coach at Football Coaches Association back in, I believe it was January, made a proposal to expand our football playoffs. That proposal was made to our board of directors and our board of directors asked our football administrator, Bo Rugg, to weigh in on that. Obviously, he did all his research, did the research on cost analysis of it, uh, officials availability, everything of the sort, and provided that input to the board. And our board yesterday then approved that. And they approved it, um, a lot of misleading things out there, but they approved it to increase the opportunities for teams to get into the football playoffs. Ironically, football right now is the only sport in the OHSAA 
that does not permit all of its teams into the postseason tournament. And, you know, you can look at it either way. Some sports say we shouldn't let everybody in in these other tournaments, or many say, too, we ought to let everybody in in football. So the, the decision, I'm sure, I'm speaking for our board on this, but our decision primarily was rooted in giving more opportunities to kids at the member schools. Well, it's hard to believe we're already 22 minutes in, but I have a handful more questions. If you're game to answer a few more, Jerry, we can stay on a little longer. I'm game and I promise I will shorten my answers. <laughs> no, we appreciate your thoroughness and transparency. So I'll just continue running down the list. Opening fields at schools is critical to moving forward with even non-contact conditioning. Are school administrators willing to open their facilities before July 1st? Great question. Um, I don't honestly know that. And I think that's something where, um, yeah, we play a role in that, but I think that's also with it being the governor's decision, you know, the governor will decide that. And if, if I'm sure they've done the research to know, you know, he has a closer contact with uh, the state superintendent of schools and everybody else. So, um, you know, our feedback is not statistically um, accurate when we, you know, because a lot of ours is through athletic directors, but uh, I would say that this, uh, the um, uh, governor would probably know that better. Great. The NCAA is considering a plan of moving football to the spring, guessing that's not possible for high school. And what is the financial fallout as detailed as possible they're requesting facing OSHA if no football is pay for play an option? It's interesting because for high school football, from the first scrimmage to the last regular season game, the revenue from those ticket sales is all a, a function of, and received by the member schools. So it's not that this organization, I would say we don't receive a dime from any regular season contest or scrimmage. Um, but the important aspect of that is that that could be a huge drain on schools because it does fund the bulk of their athletic departments and without that revenue and also i'm sure cutbacks coming to the schools themselves next year through the state budget not our budget but the state of ohio's budget could be very very challenging many people uh, see a school bus on the road, four band buses and four school buses with football players on it going to an away game and think that that's just free. Somebody has to pay that. And through the years, and I speak to this as a former athletic director, there was a day when the school's general budget paid that. And school general budgets started getting tighter. They saw that athletic departments made money on their own through ticket sales. And I think we'll have the athletic departments pay their share of that. Most athletic departments today do. Without that revenue, you're talking a huge, I mean, if there are no fans in the stands, it's a huge revenue loss and a huge concern for schools themselves. So moving to the spring, there was a proposal out there to switch spring sports to fall sports. That's what really got some traction. We did not put that out there, but it was out there and it's been discussed. And my original comment to that is, if we were to move spring sports into the fall, I'll say baseball, softball, for example, tennis, lacrosse, track and field, we move those to the fall. Well, why would we do that? We would do it because we want football and that to move to the spring so it can be played, right? We would, so what you're saying, what somebody's saying is then we're anticipating the fall sports being canceled then. That's the only reason we would do it. If we're gonna move those sports into the fall, with the idea they're gonna get canceled, we've already canceled spring sports once this year, this past spring, this spring. Why would we do that to cancel them again? I can't do that to the kids. The problem with having just football move to the spring in high school, which is different than college and anything else, is we have so many multiple sport athletes. So now all of a sudden we've got some dynamics to work with. You know, I'm not saying they can't be, but at the same time, that's a huge dynamic to work. And my third answer to that, the third part of that, is we have several leagues around the state, one of them being the OVAC, the Ohio Valley Athletic Conference. 
that sits over on the West Virginia border, Wheeling area, St. Clairsville, those schools, and it's a very big conference, those schools are in a conference with schools from another state. So unless they move, that becomes a big problematic issue. Conneaut, up in the northeast corner of the state, is in a league, and every member of the league, except Conneaut, is in Pennsylvania. So unless these other states would move too, and in a short frame of time, it's difficult. Well, switching from football to basketball, uh, someone asked, June is normally a month where athletes cannot practice with their summer teams. Will we see this restriction being lifted as we prepare for July tournaments? Let me give you the governor's number and you can call him. Because, and again, I'm not saying that, I'm a former coach, Jen, and coaches love to be in control of everything. And I'm a former basketball coach. You know, so we love to be in control. One of the most frustrating things since March 10th is not being in control of it. And I certainly don't stand in front of people and say, I don't give them the governor's number. Um, I don't point the finger and say, hey, we would be doing this if it wasn't for him or the state director of the Department of Health. But the reality is that until they safely open up, we can't answer that. The good part about that is we now do have a very good dialogue so we can offer the, uh, our input to that, but ultimately it is his decision and we will have to abide by it. And I tell people this all the time, regardless of what June is considered. I know I used to take my teams to team camp. Yeah, I know how that works. Some of my former players and coaches are coaches in this area around the state. And at the same time, never, and I know people don't like to hear this sometimes, never ever will I suggest something that compromises the safety and health of the coaches, the players, and anybody else that's allowed to be involved. So that is still the overriding factor on any recommendation I give to the governor. Well, speaking of getting the governor's number, uh, when will Ohio announce what sports fall under their low known contact sports list to be open next week? Well, actually right now, as of last Thursday, whatever the date was, the governor did that for us. And he did that by announcing, I hope I don't miss one here when, he's, when I say this, but uh, it's posted there. But uh, baseball, softball, uh, golf, tennis, swimming, and maybe I'm missing something there. But those were already identified. And keep it in mind, right after that was announced, and it was announced that on May 26th, low and no contact sports would be permitted to start with restrictions. We immediately... I mean, you, you could see my face right away, like low and no contact sports, just like everybody else asking. Um, by the way, everybody has told me today, football, lacrosse, everything is no, low or no contact is what I've been told, you know, suggested. We needed that definition. That came out the next day when he listed those within the guidance that is posted. So he has identified that so far. So when are the other ones going to be identified either either as low or no contact, or winners, when will he open up the other ones? You know, even if they're not considered low or no contact. I don't know, but I will openly say this, things change every day. Isn't that the motto right now, Jerry? For two months, that's what we've been saying, right? <laughs> Correct, and whatever time it is, that the time that we're doing this, the news conference today is at two o'clock, and it could change between now and two o'clock. And we have to, that's been the challenge for our staff is to be on the fly and ready, you know, when any of these changes do occur. Absolutely. Since a lot of people have not been working since this pandemic started, has OSHA given thought about either waiving or reducing the officials permit fees for this year? It's come up and will come up more as we approach the fall. Uh, because right now we're on the front side of it. You know, I mean, if, in other words, Let's just say that fall sports get canceled. Let's just, I hope that does not happen. And again, the optimism is that won't. But if they do, we have not started registering officials yet for the fall. So waiving that and or delaying it or whatever it might be is an option for us right now. And we certainly are looking at it. We're already delaying the registration to give us some time. Retrospectively to the spring, the challenge that we had there on returning those fees, which to my knowledge, I don't believe any state has done, 
is we provided the education that that fee, uh, their $65, uh, that's what they pay, uh, is went for. We provided them the education, we provided them the materials, and we also provide them insurance. So if summer games begin, they're actually insured through their registration fees. So we've already provided them the services. So we made the decision like so many other states that we're not gonna refund backwards, but we are going to look going forward. Great. Many schools have witnessed declining numbers in football over the last 10 years. With COVID-19 and those declining numbers, some schools may not field teams. Would OSHA think about relaxing the quote sit out rule for kids that would open enroll at another school? That's a challenging thing to do because we've learned through the years that people will, many people, not everyone, but many, many people will use any loophole they can to transfer. And again, I'm not saying that everyone will do that, but we have to look at it unintended consequences when we relax a transfer rule. Um, options are eight man football. Uh, we, we allow that. So right now I see no relaxation. There's a little bit on the transfer rule that might be relaxed and it has to do with those that played in a spring sports scrimmage. It's, it's not very many people, but other than that, I don't see us waiving that transfer rule. Well, Jerry, you know, we've taken up more than enough of your time today. So I really appreciate you being nimble with us. And again, on behalf of everyone, thank you for joining us and being so transparent. Um, we did have several questions we didn't get to, um, but they can go ahead and uh, reach out to myself at the Sports Commission through uh, Columbus Sports slash virtual sports report if they want to get in contact with you and answer some more of those questions. I know you're an open book, so we appreciate it. And, and, you know, also, thank you very much. And just one of the things I will say that through this whole pandemic and kids have been home, we started a campaign about how I compete. And that's one of the things where, if you don't mind me saying it real quick, okay. um, but we did that really because we wanted to challenge our kids to what, what are you doing? What can you do? And what can you challenge other people to do? Just because you don't have a coach forcing you, what can you do? And I know that coaches, again, I said I was one of them. We want our kids. We want to motivate them. We want to do that. But through this whole pandemic and the How I Compete campaign, that also is stimulating some good motivation on a kid's part. And there's nothing wrong with that. So it's something I just wanted to throw that out there, something that we, uh, Tim Street in our office and Kathleen Kaufman and a few others really came up with some ingenious ideas. And I thought that was very good. So thank you for having me on. And if you get the questions and get a response email, I will gladly, gladly respond. Well, we 